Hello to the Chicas. Hello to the Chicos. Um, I haven't used this uh, greetings for a while and it was requested that it should make its return. So indeed, hello ladies and gents. How are you going? Today we are going to um, introduce a series, I suppose, if um, the crowd shows any interest whatsoever in this. Um, it's a bit of a sidekick of the understanding your openings. Um, we are going to tackle um, gambits and my first intention was actually to uh, put a lot of them together and um, finish them off in one video but then I realized that a, it would be too dense, two it would be a bit too heavy, three it's just not really a good structure so instead what we are going to do here is to make it short and sharp we are going to deal with some nonsense gambit we are going to hammer it as hard as we can so that you guys know how to play against nonsense now before I get even into it too heavily and too excitedly, I would like to clarify that I'm definitely not having a go at anybody here. Um, nowadays you can find a lot of very well-known YouTubers and the streamers who promote certain extremely dodgy gambits or if not promote but you know try it out and having fun with it and I'm all for fun so that's all good but at the same time uh, I think it's also equally important that when we learn these tricks, we understand how they work and how we should refute them because in the end of the day, uh, all of the ones that I'm going to show you here are unsound and therefore one would have the desire to actually come out on top against them. And so in this spirit, I'm going to introduce today this series with the Halloween Gambit and on that note, I'm going to name at least one name and that's going to be Eric Rosen who has been working on you know, as a YouTuber and as a streamer on popularizing chess extremely successfully. And I think that his very passionate love towards opening tricks and uh, trickery in general is really something that um, that um, makes Eric who he is. And I don't want to sound like I'm trying to be here the opposing party or but here comes the grumpy guy who will tell how it's like, nah, it's not that but we need to know the truth and the truth is that some of these gambits are actually not really good at all and the first victim uh you know on that note today is going to be um the halloween gambit which uh starts off with the moves e4 e5 knight f3 knight c6 knight c3 knight f6 and knight x e5 now crazy is written on this with capital letters so we can't even deny that uh, yeah this is looking kind of not cool, but it's very easy to get caught with this if you don't know either what to do exactly, or more importantly, if you are not really armed with the right principles about how to tackle an opening like this. And here I'm going to give you a principle, because I'm very principally driven uh, when it comes to chess, uh, that is going to help you, help you a lot to overcome these tricky um, sacrifices and that is is that when you are significantly ahead in material but there is a, a growing initiative almost always the best way to deal with this is to give back some of the material in some extreme cases all of them in order to turn the tendency backwards now in this case it's a whole piece which we certainly don't have to give back in order to come out on top we can easily hang on to this piece and in fact we should but once again shredding a pawn or two on the way is not going to hurt us at all so after d4 the knight can go back both ways but there is actually a significant difference between the two i very highly recommend you to play knight g6 here by far the best move knight c6 actually invites exactly the very idea of the gambit that now these central pawns keep on rolling up Note the number of tempos that black is, sorry, white is scoring on the knight. One, oopsies, one, two, three, four. Four tempies in a row on the black knights whilst wild, white is building this insanely strong center formation. And even here, if you look at the um, engine's eval, it tells you that black is ahead. Don't play like this. This is very dangerous. The only reason why we are ahead here is because according to the engine we are and the engine can still play 47 perfect moves here for black which is going to allow black to turn this game around that's not our intention you want to keep it simple and you want to keep it 
either easy to remember or easy to understand. And what I just did there was neither. So what you do is you go back to G6 because now it's only one knight that can be hassled and it has to be hassled now by E5, otherwise White's initiative fizzles out. Now we have to drop back. Unfortunately, this is the bullet we have to bite. None of these squares are available for the knight. So you do pull back, but this is the moment when you go like, right, next we really need to somehow fight back or else we'll be pushed back to the eighth and ninth and 10th rank and uh, below the screen. So he usually white plays bishop c4, the most logical developing move, targeting the f7 pawn and also covering the central d5 square. And this is where you need to shine. This is where the principle comes into play. You go, fine, I'm a piece up. It's only a pawn that white has for it. So if I throw away another one, I will still be totally winning on material. But this move actually is going to take the wind out of their sails in two ways. They have to waste now a move on taking that pawn instead of continuing their rapid development and playing castles, queen f3 and whatnot. And also whatever takes on d5 will then be exposed to a tempi attack for ourselves. And really pretty much done dusted. If you get this far, you will more than likely come out on top in this opening. After either takes on d5, bishop takes is a tad more accurate. You play c6 kicking the bishop out and I do know that this is not a developing move but the purpose was to actually blockade the pawns and this takes us back to a very very old principle from a very very old dude Nimzovich my system when pawns are blockadable it's it, it is the desired action and after bishop b3 the engine really likes bishop b4 as the best move but uh, I'm almost inclined to favor the clearly inferior according to the engine but in my opinion very easily understandable bishop e6 move we oppose on the diagonal thus absolutely uh, neutralize any kind of pressure against f7 and we take over the control of the d5 square and from here on we are talking about the white square domination where white is actually regretting that this pawn has been pushed up because now neither f4 f5 nor d5 is a plausible threat and actually knight e7 is also a good looking move here uh, and if the knight jumps in we've got knight f5 or knight d5 it's actually maybe even more accurate because now there is another piece covering d5 and quite frankly if you look at this we have to go like yeah black is a piece up and there is nothing for it and in these cases it's super important for you to understand that yes there are two pawns but they're not enough it's simply not enough. If there is no compensation, no initiative, no attack, then the maths is not really going to cover it realistically because you would say that all oh, two points for the piece is almost equal, not even close, not even close. If there is no clear initiative for the side, who is a piece down for two pawns, that's a dead loss case. Like once again, not even close. So keep that in mind very, very clearly that with full board, even the three pawns are rarely compensating for a piece. It usually comes to play in an endgame scenario where the pawns can be marching forward. But right here, like what do these two pawns exactly do to me that intimidate me? Not really an awful lot. So how did we do this? Let's go through. They sacked the piece. We took it D4. We go to G6 so that only one knight is subjected to the harassment of the pawns. That's the big difference between having the knight here and not here. So now after we drop back, we are really ready to go. We can't be pushed around anymore. And as soon as that's the case, we put the pedal to the metal and we just go like, we need to accelerate development. And so we do, we kick out the bishop. This pawn move is super important to create this pawn structure rigid. So now this can't move forward without being captured by an enemy pawn. And then we are beginning to offer trades. And from here on, it's really uh, your game to win. I'm going to show you how the greatest aficionado, or from what I could gather at least online, Mr. Guzman Carlos, uh, lost it. He has at least three or four games in the Leeches database, so he's a very keen uh, practitioner of the Halloween Gambit. So he goes down in 12 moves, I think, here. Um, 
Queen d7, uh, sorry, bishop e6, castles, queen d7. No, sorry, I didn't do what I was meant to do. No, I have no idea what I'm doing now. Go back. Guzman. Here we go. My bad, gentlemen and ladies. Bishop e6 takes, takes. Queen g4, he played. Queen d7, he played uh, h4, wanting to hassle the knight. And after castles, he decided that maybe the Halloween Gambit, after all, wasn't a brilliant idea. And uh, he resigned the game and went to the cafeteria for refreshment instead of wasting more of his time playing this game out. Very clearly, after... Um, h5 knight e7 back the knight comes back to f5 the other knight comes to d5 it's a super easy game to play for black i mean the evaluation here only shows minus yeah 1.5 whatever but that's not the point the point is that it's very very difficult to play a position like this for white when we are down material we lost the initiative the structure is awful because the pawns are now stuck on black on the color of the bishop there is no d5 there is no f4 f5 what do i play for and so the very man who loves this game or sorry this opening the most among the higher rated dudes that is called it quits on move 12. And that's exactly as far as I'm concerned uh, what the Halloween Gambit deserves. I mean, once again, I would like to emphasize it's fun, it's all cool, and you can occasionally catch a couple of uh, people off guard with this. But if you are an E4, E5 player, then you must know that the way how you handle the Halloween Gambit is that you drop back to G6, you get kicked out, you drop back to G8, and when the bishop pops up on C4, you chuck the pawn in in order to then accelerate your own development. From here on, your goal is to control the white squares. So that's what we do. C6, bishop E6, and then eventually knight E7 will come. Either like this or here, knight E7. And once again, those white squares are under our command and black is going to hopefully if you are black here, win the game without too many dramas. So that was, well, I would like to not go too cocky, but basically, the, in my opinion, the best way to, ref to refute the Halloween Gambit. I hope you guys find this little tutorial handy. Uh, and if it uh, becomes indeed um, a popular series or something that you guys are keenly uh, interested in, in and you would like to see more of it then I will uh, continue because I actually have a fair few up my sleeve and some of them are really really beautiful so I hope you guys enjoyed it please express your opinions and uh, whatever you want to add in the comments below press the sub button please and uh, yeah hope to see you soon thank you bye